All right, welcome everybody to the webinar. Uh, I see that you're all still piling in, but I'll just get started. As a reminder, uh, we have a chat feature off to the side there. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them and I will make sure to note them and get them to the presenters after they're done with their presentation and they can answer them. So real quick, my name is Thomas. And before we get into our webinar workforce planning, uh, begin with the end in mind. I'm going to give a little bit of information on our company. So who is Chimura? We provide labor market data and analysis so you guys can make informed decisions that help your communities thrive. We were founded in 1998 by Dr. Chris Chimura. And we have offices in Richmond, Cleveland, and the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Who we are is economists, data scientists, statisticians, and business professionals who care about helping your community grow. And we do that primarily through our Jobs EQ platform, which is able to provide labor market data. It is the best labor market data source on the market. And in addition to Jobs EQ, we also provide consulting, including working with that labor data and also possibly getting strategic plans to you and your organization. We are driven by client satisfaction and success, and excellence is our first priority in both customer service and data quality. We also have a number of free resources uh, because we really do care about providing these, these data and analysis over to you to help your community thrive, including our weekly economic update. If you want, you can subscribe to the weekly economic update, and every weekend you'll get it delivered right to your inbox. It's written by our economists, including Dr. Chris Chimura. And in addition, to some other free resources we have, we have a blog up on the website that we post frequently, as well as a podcast that is on all major streaming platforms. So let's talk about our speakers today. Leslie Peterson is the President and Chief Strategy Officer of Chimura Economics and Analytics. She heads up all our strategy development and marketing endeavors, as well as conducting research and delivering on projects. Prior to joining Chimura, Leslie worked in the chemical industry, including 10 years at Eastman Chemical Company, where she served as a worldwide sales coordinator. Leslie is a LEAD Virginia 2007 alumni. Her professional memberships include the International Economic Development Council, the National Association of Workforce Boards, and the Virginia Economic Developers Association. Mark Hayes is the current Managing Director of Sales and Business Development at Chimura. He's made a career and developed a life's passion for helping people succeed, helping businesses grow, and communities thrive. He's done this by helping employers and regions understand their local labor market's role in attracting talent, growing existing companies, and bringing new business to the community. All right, take it away, Mark. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. And again, thank you again, everyone, for being here today. It's, it's good to see so many uh, uh, of you that I know, some of you that I haven't met, but I hope we get that opportunity soon uh, as we start to come out of the pandemic, uh, pandemic and we can uh, do more face-to-face uh, interaction. I'm. I'm. Uh, I for one, I'm, uh, can't wait for that to happen because I want want to meet you all and and hear about your issues and challenges that you're facing and 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 how we at Chimura can can help you in in those efforts. So, anyway, again, thank you very much uh, for being here, taking your time, uh, taking time out of your day, and I hope we can provide you some some good and useful information here when it comes to workforce planning. When I look at workforce planning, I look, I look at these, these three areas. What are your obstacles, your solutions, your outcomes? And, and when, we, when we take a look at obstacles, I want people to understand that you should welcome obstacles because it generates conversation. It generates good ideas. It generates brainstorming. You know, as humans, we, we, we want to be problem solvers. How can we help, you know, not only ourselves do better, but, but, our, but, our, but our fellow human beings, our communities, how do we how can we do things whether it's in our work or our personal life to help uh, overcome challenges and to make things better and and a workforce plan is one of those things that that can that could be a game changer for your organization your region your company whatever the case may be and it can be the difference between whether or not you stagnate 
as an organization or as a region or that you grow. And we're also going to talk a little bit about this demo, the demographics cliff that's coming up and how that's going to drastically affect the way that you plan for workforce issues in your community and, and organizations and, 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 and so forth, because it is a definite reality. We've been seeing this for years, and, and now it's starting to, 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 to really raise its ugly head and, and, and make a difference in the way that we're having to plan. So what are some of the solutions that we can offer you that, that we can help you with? We want to talk about that. I want to discuss why labor market intelligence drives this effort, drives your workforce plan. If you don't have good quality labor market intelligence, uh, your plan is going to really suffer. And, and, and it's not just a plan for your workforce. It should be the blueprint for economic growth in, in your region. And what we want to do here is, is, is actually have a plan when we're talking about outcomes that gets read, it gets Im implemented. You know, I know those of you in the public workforce system are required by law to complete a plan every four years and, and then update it every two years. If, if all you're doing is doing a plan just for compliance purposes, just to keep the state or the feds off your back, and you set this plan up on a shelf, and in two years you pick it up and you maybe tweak it here or there, uh, that's not doing anybody any good. It wastes people's time, it wastes resources, and it's not really giving you that oomph that you need to, 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 to provide the, the growth in your region and, and to, uh, to really align your workforce issues. And so what we want here is a region that attracts talent and employers. We want companies that grow, that attract talent, that, you know, I want to go to work for this company or I want to move to this region. And we want a plan that is actionable. It's alive. It basically makes things happen in your region. It is what we look at, what we do. It's what we're all about. So what are some of those obstacles that we're talking about? You know, what, first of all, why should I care about planning? You know, people say, oh, I'm a planner. You know, I'm not a planner. I'm a doer. Well, Yogi Berra says, you know, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. How do I get the community engaged? Indira Gandhi says, you know, you have a bias towards action. Let's see something happen now. You can break that big plan into small steps. You can take the first step right away. This is the key. You know, you don't get lost in the process. You, you know, and setting the goal is not the main thing, according to Coach Tom Landry. It's deciding how you will go about achieving it and staying with that plan. This is the actionable part of the plan. This keeps things moving. You know, it's, it's not necessarily the goal, but what steps are you taking to get to that goal? And that should be a constant process and, and getting to that uh, where you're getting to that goal. You got to stir the pot. Stagnation and status quo won't do, whether you're in a, in a workforce board, whether you're an economic developer, whether you're in a company, you cannot stagnate. You've got to, to, to move forward. And it's not the strongest of the species that survive, according to Charles Darwin. It's not the most intelligent, but it's the ones that are most responsive to change. So ask yourself, how responsive are we to change? How willing are we to change? So, so why is workforce planning important? You know, Abe, Abe Lincoln said, give me six hours to chop down a tree. I'll spend the first four sharpening the ax. One of my favorite quotes of, uh, of all time. The planning helps identify your goals. It gets all partners on the same page. You know, the, and, 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 you know, we don't want the plan to be something that wastes people's time. We're all busy and we're busier than ever. So our time is, is more precious to us than ever. We don't want to be wasting our time, our partner's time, we, you know, good developed plan that really, you know, uses critical thinking rather than emotion really can be a time saver for everyone because it puts everyone on the same page, all striving toward those goals and taking the steps to get there. What are your challenges? Those are the challenges that we have to look at. You know, in, in all of my years, whether I was in, in, in higher education, economic development, whatever the case may be, you know, the, when, when, when a company would come in and want to, you know, maybe, uh, put in a new facility or a site selector would come in and is looking at a community. They don't expect everything to be perfect in that region. They don't expect a perfect workforce. That, 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 that's just, the, you know, that's a given. They, they want to know what are you doing to correct those deficiencies? What are you doing as a community? How are you working together to solve uh, the, the problems that you have when it comes to your workforce issues? Where should the resources go? Resources aren't infinite. We know that resources are a finite thing. And so, you know, where do we shift resources to areas that need help, that need more emphasis? 
Where do we take away resources? Just as important to help those other areas. You know, are we wasting money on things that, that have become irrelevant? And then also this time of uncertainty. If I had told you two years ago that you would you know, be working from home for a substantial period of time, that you would you know, have to, to, to be putting uh, all of your courses online for students to take, you know, if, if you, know, you were having to figure out all new workforce schedules, that is uh, something that, that people had no clue about two years ago. And, and you would have thought I'm crazy. You know, I was crazy if I'd told you that. But now we know. So workforce planning now involves situations like a pandemic. What do we do? How do we adjust? How do we attract new talent in, in times of uncertainty? How are we going to grow? How are we going to expand, you know, our region, our community, our company? And then wh who else needs to be at the table here? Who, who brings expertise that, that we don't have now? And, and really you know, dive into the critical thinking aspects of this to make this a, 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 you know, an actionable living document. So, so how do I get you know, the organization, the community engaged? And, and J.R. Tolkien said it, it, it does not do to leave a live dragon out of your calculations if you live near one. So who or what are, are the live dragons that you're facing? So, so, so live dragon number one, let's just take a look at this. The minimum wage. Minimum wage has not kept pace with worker productivity. If it had, the minimum wage today would be $24.18 an hour. No one is suggesting that you go out and raise the minimum wage to 24 bucks an hour today. No one's suggesting that at all. But the last time that, that in inflation-adjusted terms th that it happened in, was in 1968 that we had the minimum wage that, that kept pace with productivity, 1968. And I was alive then, but I wasn't very old. So that gives you some idea of, of, of how productivity has far outpaced the, the, the minimum wage. So this is issues in your community. It's issues with your workforce. What are we doing to, to, to help uh, wages keep up with productivity in our, in our economy today? So live dragon number two, we're picking on Lancaster County, Nebraska here. No particular reason. I've been there. It's a beautiful place. I love it. Uh, but I just happened to just it's one I decided to, to, to pick on today, and we're not really picking on them. We're just showing that every region has challenges that it faces, and Lancaster County, Nebraska is, is no exception. Lancaster County, the, uh, the biggest city there is Lincoln. Lincoln, of course, the state capital, home to the University of Nebraska. Uh, and so we want to take a look at some of the things that, that, that Lancaster County is facing. So the first thing I want you to look at here is the living wage. This is uh, put together by the, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, their living wage calculator. They do it for every county in the United States. You can go there and, and look this stuff up, this stuff up very easily. So, I, you know, if, if I live in Lancaster County and I'm a single person and I don't have any kids, um, you know, it's it's not bad. Hey, fourteen dollars and seventy two cents an hour. Not bad at all. You know, I, you know, I, with, with just a few skills, I can probably go into the marketplace there, into the workforce, and I can probably find something that gets me close to that wage. But here's the problem. What happens if I'm a single parent with one child, with two kids, with three kids? Look at what I have to do in order to, to earn a living wage. If I just have, if I'm a single parent with one child, you know, I've got to make north of $30 an hour just to, to, to make a living wage in Lancaster County, Nebraska. If I've got two kids, it, it's, you know, it's, it's near $38 an hour. And if I've got three kids, I've got to make nearly 50 bucks an hour for a living wage. Now, if you have two adults in the household, you know, and, and, and they're both working, that, that definitely is a help because then they, that, that pressure to, for one person to make so much money is not there. That just stands to reason. So, so the thing here is that how many people in your community, these are things that you need to, to explore. How many people in your organization, in your company, you know, how many people are you serving it, through your workforce system that are single, single parents with one, two, three, and maybe more kids? That This is a real economic crisis for these folks, and it, and it affects your company. It affects your region as these people are trying to get to, to the living wage threshold. So our, our next live dragon, and this is, again, is in, in, in Lancaster County. And this is one of the things I pulled from our Jobs EQ platform. Uh, we have extensive uh, 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 numbers in there on demographics. It goes, it, you know, there, there are several categories in there that you can look at. But I just happened to zero in on this one in Lancaster County because 
this leads to when, when we talk about diversity and inclusion in your workforce plan. I think we all agree that 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 a diverse workforce, you know, an inclusive organization is critical for economic success. And it's not it's not only critical for economic success, it's just the right thing to do. And so I, I zeroed in on, on pulling some demographics here from Lancaster County. And you can see that that they are an overwhelmingly uh, white population, Caucasian population. And so if I'm a site selector, does that make a difference to me? If I'm trying to expand a company into Lancaster County, does that make a difference to me? Now, th there's more, you know, there's more facets to diversity uh, other than just than, than race. We all know that there are there, you know, there's 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 veterans, there's multi-generational issues. How do the baby boomers, for example, react with the millennials and the generation Zs and 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 on and on? You know, that that diversity and inclusion part is part of your workforce plan. How are we going to to make this mesh? How do we make these organizations or these uh these particular demographic groups work together? So what are we doing in, in looking at diversity and inclusion? And Jobs EQ gives us some numbers, you know, for our community that we can look at to, to hopefully uh, address these issues in our planning process and, and make that a strength in our region. Now, so what does the latest census uh, results uh, that have just come out tell us? Well, for the first time in five decades, uh, five decades, more than half the counties in the country lost population. Two thirds of rural counties, a third of metro counties, lost population over the past decade. And, and then this issue of declining birth rates. You know, <laughs> the, the, the average American of child rearing age today has 17% fewer children than in 1990 and about 50% fewer than in 1960. And if you think back to, to a couple of slides ago when we were showing the living wage in Lancaster County for a single parent with one child, $30 an hour, it, it, it stands to reason why we're having fewer kids today. They're expensive. They're very expensive. You know, things like child care costs and everything going up through the roof, medical care, all that thing. It costs a lot of money to raise a child, as those of you who have them know. And so so people are not having the children today that they did 50, 60 years ago. Uh, and this has put a really, you know, a, a big crimp in our workforce availability all throughout all throughout this nation. So, you know, there's there's only two ways you get more people. You either birth them. Or, or you bring them in through immigration. And so we see the birth rates dropping. Immigration is, 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 is going to have to be the savior to build up the workforce numbers in this country. I don't care who's in the White House or the politics of it. That's just simple demographics. And what we have to look at, we either have to start birthing more babies or we got to start bringing more people into the country because we have 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day. Who's, who's filling their, their spots? Who's filling those spots? The, the numbers just don't add up. And so that's an issue and something that you're going to have to address in your workforce plan. And perhaps the most telling thing to me, there are now more Americans aged 80 and older than two or younger. You know, we are a rapidly aging population in this country. And, and it's, it's very simple. These demographic realities will hamper future economic growth. Is your region going to address it? Is your region going to come up with solutions? How are you going to do this so that your region or your organization can continue to grow? And of course, with with anytime there's shortages, there's going to be an increasing war for this talent across the country. You know, people are, are are going to be offering things that that you haven't seen before. For example, cities like Tulsa, Topeka, that that are offering people ten thousand dollars a year to move there and 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 start up businesses and everything. This is, I think, we're going to see more and more of things like this. How is that going to affect your workforce plans? How is it going to affect entrepreneurship? How is it going to affect startups? And, and supporting your small businesses in, in your community. Now, our live dragon number four, this is for my education friends, and this affects everyone uh, you know, in, in, in the community. When we see the enrollment projections starting in 2025, you know, we saw a blip in enrollment decline due to the pandemic. That was a temporary solution. Starting in 2025, it's not. This becomes you know, this cliff that we're seeing a decline in college going students. So how does that affect your workforce planning? You know, do, do you focus on 18, 19, 20 year olds as part of the workforce pipeline? Are they important? Absolutely they are. But what about adult learners? What about the, the 25, the 30, the 35, the 40 year olds that are looking to, to expand their skills, 
but they don't want to spend two years in a, in a college or four years in a college. They, you know, they come to you and they say, you know, I need something that I can learn in two months so that I can go into the workforce and make a living wage. How can you help me? That's how your thinking is going to have to shift. It's going to have to think about what are we doing short term industry certifications? What are we doing to, to make that work in our community? And the headlines simply tell the story. We, we you know, you've seen these. Uh, the, the enrollment uh, drops in the, in the community colleges, the, uh, the, the, the problems with high school dropouts, the birth rate. We sell, you know, see there that you know, U.S. birth rate falls to a 32-year low, numbers that, uh, that we haven't seen and uh, drops in the birth rate since the Great Depression, um, co uh, coming college enrollment busts, and so on and on and on that, that, that we see these, these headlines. So what are we going to do about it? And then also this this particular shift here that students of color now represent more than 45% of undergraduate students compared to just 30% in 1996. That number is projected to continue to grow. So how are we, you know, doing our workforce plan, looking at, you know, uh, more people of color, for example, coming into our community, coming into the workforce, you know, how, are, you know, how, are, how does that change things from, from the way that we've done business in the past? And then the, the, the high school dropout problem. This is in 2019. This is not even the 2020, uh, 2021 academic year yet, which could be, uh, you know, much, much worse than what we're seeing here. They're still doing head counts on this. But we cannot have this entire lost generation of young people out there with no skills that aren't contributing to our workforce because they dropped out of high school. What are we doing to work with our K-12 uh, institutions in town to, 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 for, for dropout prevention programs. And then for those students who do drop out, what are we doing working, for example, with our community college to bring them back in so they can get the high school equivalency diploma so that they can learn technical skills can get into the workforce or perhaps continue their education. These are absolutely critical questions that you're going to have to answer. You can't hide under a rock because these are realities that are slapping most organizations, most communities, most regions right in the face. So when it comes to your workforce planning, I would I would tell you this, don't focus on college degrees, focus on skills, because more and more employers out there, big name employers, for example, uh, have gotten to the point where they're saying, I really don't care about the degree. What can you do for me? What skills do you have? I am not trying to downplay degrees at all. I'm a product of research universities. I have a graduate degree. So so I and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. But what I'm, when I was in school, when I was an undergrad, for example, the advice was just go out, get a degree. It doesn't matter what it's in. And that was sound advice at the time because that's what we were looking for. We didn't have a whole lot of college graduates uh, that, that were in, in, our, in our economy then. Th that has increased now. But the other thing to recognize is that a lot of those skills those graduates have and that, that are getting, they're, they're not relevant to employers in the workplace. So what are we doing? to address that. And so that's why I tell my higher education friends, focus on skills. Don't necessarily focus on degrees. What are you doing to get people the skills they need to compete in, in the workforce? And we see this, and I, I would urge you to look up at the, at the top right there, the quote from, from Forbes, employers that get better at recognizing skills will be better positioned to improve both the talent and diversity of their workforces relative to their degree distracted competitors and unleash the full potential of their individuals and teams. In your workforce planning, don't become degree distracted. Are degrees important? Yes, I can't emphasize that enough, but skills are just as, or maybe even more important in today's modern economy, and that's what that's what will advance your region and and your organization more so than just the the the, the fact that you have a bunch of degree holders in in your population. Digital skills absolutely critical. I was in in Washington three to four years ago and meeting with some people, uh, executives from Microsoft, uh, and they looked at my uh, college's catalog and they said, "Why are you?" why are you teaching 16 week courses in Microsoft office? Uh, they said, why are you wasting resources in that? And they said, this, these are our products. And we're asking you that question. You know, we have children in the fourth and fifth grade that are proficient in Microsoft office by the time they're nine and 10 years old. Why are you teaching this at the college level? Employers now expect you 
to, to be proficient in Microsoft Office applications when you walk in the door. So, so why are you teaching this at, at the community college level? If you're going to teach it, do it on Saturday mornings as part of co community education and charge people $25 to be in a 9 to 12 o'clock class or something like that. Don't waste your resources on this. You have much more important things that you can be teaching because you, the, the, people should have the Microsoft Office skills by the time that, that they're in high school. So, so digital skills gaps. You know, what are we doing to address those, you know, to, to get people up to, to snuff, not only on Microsoft Office, but also in, in, in popular platforms like Salesforce, for example. What are we doing in, in the areas of Java and Python programming lang languages? What are we doing to, to get our workforce prepared for the, for the, 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 the intensely uh, technologically, technologically focused businesses that are becoming more and more prevalent across our country? Now, what's the foundation for identifying obstacles and also the foundation for solutions here? So what I look at is that, you know, I when I was first hired at Dallas College as, as the vice chancellor of workforce and economic development, first person hired for the position, the chancellor brought me in and he said, you know, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to create a labor market intelligence center. He said it was our North Star and you don't know you know, where you're going unless you can look at that North Star to guide you. And so he wanted labor market intelligence to be that North Star, to, to not only help our colleges with program review, you know, which, which program should we keep, which one should we scale back on, which one should we ramp up, but also to help communities, to help, you know, uh, economic developers, to help chambers of commerce, uh, to help site selectors, to, uh, to, to, to help organizations and, and companies all throughout the, the Dallas region. So, so what could we do? So I immediately picked up the phone and called Chris Chimura and Leslie Peterson at Chimura Economics and Analytics. I'd, I'd, I'd met them many years before, was doing some, some work in Oklahoma, and I needed some economic impact studies done. So I picked up the phone and called them. They did a wonderful job for me because I wanted to, to talk to them about Jobs EQ. Jobs EQ is the first thing I did when I was setting up a labor market intelligence center because I, 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 I valued the data. I knew it was the premier data out there. And that's what I wanted to lay the foundation for this labor market intelligence center. And that was the first call I made. And so, you know, why do we do what we do at, at Chimura? You know, we, as we said, we want to help people succeed. We want to help businesses grow. We want to help communities thrive. You know, are we a data company? Yes. Are we a software company? Yes. But it's more than that. It's, you know, when, when communities thrive, when businesses grow, when people are succeeding, then we're succeeding as a company. And, and so we look at it in, as far as workforce planning goes as like, you know, what can we do to help our clients, you know, better their businesses, better their regions, better the people they're serving. And if, and if, and if we can help them do that, that benefits them and that benefits, you know, Chimura Economics and Analytics when it comes to our bottom line, of course. And, and so it's, it's, it's very critical. That, that that you understand that we're here to help you. And it's not just about selling you consulting services or selling you software. It's about these things that we're talking about right here on this slide. And we want to help you do that. So many of you have seen this. If, you, if you're a Jobs EQ subscriber, and we certainly appreciate you and, and thank you for that. Uh, you see these different analytics that are available to you. And I'm just going to point out a couple and, and, and using our, uh, our, our Lancaster County, Nebraska, uh, uh, example here. So, you know, this is real simple. I, you know, clicked on the button, you know, it took about 10 seconds, pull this stuff up and it shows me what are the top occupations in Lancaster County, Nebraska. It gives me the, you know, the employment numbers. It gives me the, you know, the mean annual wages, the location quotient. And it also very importantly gives me the five-year forecast. What am I looking at? So if I'm a workforce board, for example, what occupations do we need to be focusing on that, that are growing in our economy? Which, you know, which ones do we need to scale back on? If I'm the community college, same thing. Where do we need to emphasize training for, uh, you know, for students that are coming in into our institution? If I'm an economic developer or if I'm a company, I can look and see, okay, what's growing occupation-wise, what isn't? How do we adjust our workforce planning to make sure that, that, that we can meet the needs of our, of our labor market? And then the same thing here, the top industries. What are my top industries? Who, you know, who, who is, you know, providing the fuel to the fire for our local economy here? And, and, you know, we look at this and what kind of an economic impact 
do these industries have? And there's analytics and jobs EQ that will measure that for you as well, as well as the supply chain. How well are we set up to supply these industries in our local economy with, with the support businesses that, that, that help these companies, you know, uh, sustain growth. So, so we're always looking at things about how we can do this. What is, you know, what is the thing that, that we can do to, to help our, our businesses grow, to help our region grow, help our people succeed. This is an analytic that the, in Jobs EQ that we call what if. And I use this ex extensively in higher education. And I'll tell you why, because uh, like I said, I, I worked a lot of times with site selectors, with economic development organizations who were trying to bring in new companies, new business. And so I would look at this and would say, okay, how can we help you? What do we need to do as an educational institution to, to, to do everything we can to try to help this business with its ex expansion or relocation and to, and to help this community. So basically what this tells me, let's, and I use the example again, Lancaster County, and I'm going to open a new hospital or I'm going to expand my hospital by, you know, 300 workers. And so this gives me an idea of the availability of the jobs that I'm going to have to have to staff my hospital, you know, right here. And so when I look at this, if, if you're in the green, you're pretty much okay for those occupations. You're, you're, you know, you're pretty, you're pretty good. You know, our Tremor economists tell us that if you're 50 and above here, you know, chances are you're going to have, you know, pretty good success of finding people to, to fill those particular occupations in your business expansion. Now, if you're, if you're in the orange or the darker red, you may have some issues. So for example, here, I'm looking at this and if I'm a workforce board or if I'm community college or a, I'm a city manager, economic developer, whatever the case may be, I need to say, we need to up our game for registered nurses. We need to up our game for rad techs. We need to up our game for respiratory therapists and then for surgical techs. You know, we, we need more people coming into the pipeline to help fill those, to help fill those positions. So then I can go to, for example, to my K-12 and say, okay, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Superintendent, what are you doing in the, at the K-12 level to prepare people for these occupations so that they can go into community college or go into university and, and, and get the credentials they need in order to fill these jobs? So as a site selector or as someone who's wanting to expand their business, those are the kind of things I'm looking for because every region I go to, I'm going to see orange and I'm going to see red areas that, that where there, there's a, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a, of a squeeze in the labor pipeline. So my, my important thing is not that you have that, but what are you doing in your workforce planning to address those issues? That's the most critical thing that I'm looking at if I'm looking to expand my business into, into your community or region. And then the award gaps, where, you know, where are, we, where are we falling down annually in the number of awards that we're giving out? The red, of course, shows us areas where we need to up our game a bit. The blue areas show where we're doing a better job. And so this is, you know, very, like I say, takes about 10 seconds. I pull this up and I look at it and it gives me a graphic picture immediately saying, okay, this is areas that we need to focus on training more people to get credentials in, in, in these areas. And then the hard skill gaps as well. You know, what, what are we doing? What do we need to do? If I'm the community college, for example, what do I need to do in my curriculum? I've got a lot of people that are short in medical terminology. What do we need to do to increase people who, who are proficient in medical terminology? And then on down the list a little bit, you'll see Spanish. We see this more and more that, 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 that workforce regions, that regions are needing Spanish speakers. And so what are we doing as a K-12 institution, as a community college, as a community uh, in general? to help people uh, learn more Spanish so that they can compete in uh, for the jobs that are needed in our, uh, in our economy. And then certifications, this tells me very quickly, okay, what, what are, you know, what are we short of here? What are employers telling us? What kind of skill gaps do they have when it comes to certifications? And so you can see there a CPR certification, you know, hazmat, uh, you know, a class A CDL, for example, LPNs, those are the kind of things that our employers are telling us. These are the kind of certifications they need then and where they're short right now and where they need, uh, you know, training providers to up their game to help uh, to help us fill those uh, to help uh, fill those certifications. And then this is this is an analytic we call real time intelligence. We scrape around 40,000 uh, websites a day at Chimura for, uh, you know, they're, they're, they can be, you know, company websites, their job boards, that sort of thing. You know, what are people advertising 
in Lancaster County, Nebraska. So I'll pull this up here and you can see I've got, you know, 428 total ads for retail salespersons. I've got 369 uh, total ads for registered nurses, tractor trailer, truck drivers, a lot of ads for those, nursing assistants as well. So, the, you know, we pull this from, you know, from, from you know, there's 10,000 jobs being posted uh, there today. Uh, you know, there's 542 occupations, uh, you know, over 2,000 employers. And then, then we, we can look at who's posting those jobs. As you might suspect in with Lincoln, Nebraska, being the uh, head of Nebraska state government, being the state capital, you're going to have a lot of state government jobs posted there. And also you have some health care providers, Southeast Community College, the public school system. So you can see, and then you can click on those and you can actually see those raw ads as they come out. And you can read those and see, okay, what, what have we got here? What are they really asking for? And these are non-duplicated ads, as I said, that are that we update this uh, every single day uh, on Jobs EQ. And then our outcomes. So, you know, what I, as far as my part of this goes, what I want to leave you with, um, if labor market intelligence is driving your planning process, your workforce planning process, you're engaging people with critical thinking rather than emotion. Don't do this by emotion because if it's emotion, this is where you come up with goals, you put it on a shelf, and nobody thinks about it for two years. You know, using labor market intelligence because your labor market is constantly changing, you're looking at ways, what do we need to do? How do we pivot? How do we move? How do we make things different? You know, how do we respond to this blip in the economy or this or that that's happened in our community? Labor market intelligence gives you that power and gives you that ability. And remember what Coach, Coach Landry said, it's not about setting the goal. What steps are you taking to get to the goal? That's what keeps people engaged. That's what makes things work uh, in, in, in this process. And I'm a firm believer that a dynamic living workforce plan will attract talent, it attracts entrepreneurs, and it attracts business to a community. And, and communities that are growing you know, for the most part, they don't just get lucky. There's a plan there. They figured something out. They're doing things the right way. It's not like the 1849 California gold rush where someone spots a gold nugget in a stream and thousands of people pour in. That just doesn't exist anymore. You know, it, it, it's a lot more scientific. It's a lot more systematic. How, you know, what role are you playing in workforce planning to make sure that your community is, 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 is focusing on sustainable long-term growth that meets the needs of your employers and your community and the people who live in that community. So with that being said, I, it's, it's indeed a pleasure to bring in Leslie Peterson, our president and chief strategy offer, uh, officer for uh, Chamura Economics and Analytics. Uh, Leslie has, you know, has, has plowed a lot of ground in, 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 the, in the space of, of workforce planning and, and strategic planning. And uh, I can't think of, of a better expert to talk to you now more about the, uh, the processes of this. And uh, she's uh, got some, some very interesting thoughts as well. So Leslie, please take it away. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for that macroeconomic presentation. It's uh, certainly going to frame uh, what we're going to talk about next uh, in a very good way. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you. Let's jump into it. Mark has been talking about workforce planning, and he mentioned the North Star. He mentioned critical thinking. We want you to also think predictive thinking. As we move between the intersection of where your big ideas and the realistic complications of strategic, of strategic engagement, how complicated that can be, but how simple it can be if we just break it down the right way. Next slide. We're gonna talk about a common sense approach to action planning for your workforce. Next slide. For example, let's take this client and maybe you're the client or maybe your, your client has a client. And taking everything that Mark just did, you can come up with a major economic statement. And that statement is powerful because it tells you just exactly where you are today in the workforce planning process. So we're gonna look at three different approaches and a process manner to do this critical thinking. One, we'll do an internal analysis. That's where you bring all the stakeholders together. And then the, 
the world of Zoom. You'll be doing that digitally, and it can be very effective. In some ways, it's more effective. And you'll get an idea of what your stakeholders think about the data that Mark just presented and get some dialogue going about the current economy. Well, why do you need this economic statement? Well, the workforce underpins the economy. And so you need an, an idea of how the economy is performing, which industries are growing, which industries are dying, so that you're constantly working with your job seekers and, and preparing for demand skills, occupations and skills, as Mark said. You'll take that analysis and then you'll go into phase two and you'll be doing a SWOT and a PEST analysis. The SWOT looks at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to your local workforce. The PEST will look at political, economic, social, and technological issues. And then we'll come up with an idea of competitive positioning because you'll want to be benchmarking to your peers. Next slide. You see it all the time, vision statements, mission statements. They sit on a website. Sometimes they make sense. Sometimes they don't, um, but it's, it's simple. What do you want to do in the future? Mark mentioned the North Star. What are your goals for the future? Next three to five years. That's, that's a kind of a manageable timeline. So we want to move from the as is current state to the desired future state or the to be workforce. Next slide. When we're talking about the current state, and we think about our mission, our mission is what we do. We go to the office every day, or we work from home every day. We're chipping away at workforce issues. That's what we do every day. And that is guided by our operations and our standard operating procedures. And what, we, what do we measure? Well, we measure what's working, what's not working. What's working, you want to optimize and rise above the status quo. What's not working, you need corrective actions, major improvement opportunities. Next slide. Mark spoke about the public workforce system and how that system works to reaffirm the retail footprint of the one-stop system, and it builds on proven practices, sector strategies, career pathways. You'll be working closely with economic developers, site selectors, educators. Next slide. So what do we think about this mission critical, what do we do everything, tying operations to strategies? So you take your mission, you, you've gone through that, you know what you're doing every day, you know what's working, what's not working, and then you apply that across the organization, your internal organization. And from the internal organization of the mission with the standard operating procedures underneath, you apply those organizational strategies. Those are the strategies that impact the inner workings of an organization. You bring in the business function goals and those goals will be tied to those organizational strategies that back up to the total organization, that back up to the mission. And you'll, you'll want to put your strategies in different buckets. So you have finance strategies, marketing strategies, operation strategies, and all of these back up to the big vision of the corporation or your organization or your community. And then it gets pretty tactical once you start applying the standard operating procedures. That's step by step by step by step for each one of those strategies. Next slide. Strategies can have dimensions and they need to have dimensions because they've got to work through linking strategies to other organizations, to other departments, Etc. So here's an example of a strategic dimension map where you've got your business linking up with its values and benefits to management, and those measures of management affect jobs and structure. And so you always want to be working within stable processes inside the organization or outside the organization. Next slide. SWAT. How many times have you seen this done? I'm sure most of you have participated in a SWOT, and it's a good first step. Um, gives you your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, 
and any threats that might be facing your organization or your community or your workforce planning needs. But we're going to take it a step further. Next slide. We're going to talk about the, a pest analysis. Pest um, allows you to do a deeper dive into opportunities and threats because many times when you go through these SWOT analysis, you're just not real sure if you've got that particular idea in the right quadrant, right? Sometimes we think a, th a threat is a weakness. So PEST allows you to drill down further and do a deep dive on political, economic, social, and technological challenges. It's, um, it's, it's in real time. Uh, you vote in real time, and then you rank importance by one to five. Next slide. A little deeper dive here into the political and economic factors. Let's say you're working with an economic, de economic development organization, and they're concerned about foreign direct investment policies. And the concern that foreign countries may have policies in place that present, prevent them from exporting properly or, or to their fullest capacity. They may be worried about economic factors, the COVID recovery. We're already seeing problems with the supply chain shifting. Uh, we're seeing at, how that's backing up to automotive. They may be concerned about trade agreements. Um, more exports equal more wealth creation. If we get into a lot of disagreements on trade, then that can help our that can hurt our economy. Inflation and labor costs are of concern. Inflation, interest rates, cost of real estate. You see that now in the housing industry. You can't buy a house right now unless you're willing to pay $100,000 over cost, asking cost. Workforce issues, transportation and infrastructure, incentives, utilities, regulatory, environmental problems. Where are the tra trailing spouses going to work? All to say by doing this level of, of drill down, you can walk hand in hand into a room and sit at the table with an expanding firm and you can be the expert at the table with labor market data. Next slide. And then there are the social factors. You drill down on those, you, do, you find perception busters and you talk about quality of life, and all of this is preparing you to go back and put these things into your strategic plan. Next slide. And then there's technical factors with um, real estate and augmented virtual reality is becoming very popular. Got computer processing, which is always important. Blockchain is making its way onto the uh, stock market. Nanotechnologies, everywhere, vaccines and therapies, we've seen that for the last year, and the Internet of Things, which is going to bring on cybersecurity challenges. Next slide. Now you've completed your SWOT, you've completed your PEST, now you can go into implementation of that strategic plan that you've just written that bounces off of Mark's background with my macroeconomic labor force data. So this is my takeaway slide for you. Action steps in a clear path per strategy, and there could be 200 of them for just one strategy, but you've got to line them up and get them implemented over a three to five year time frame. And that takes a lot of coordination and collaboration within your communities, as Mark pointed out. You want to make sure you continuously engage the stakeholders and the process owners throughout the life of your strategic plan. And then you get to do it all over again. Next slide. We thank you. We enjoyed being here today. I was delighted to have the opportunity to hear Mark and to speak with you. And we hope to see you soon. All right. Thanks, Leslie. And thanks, Mark. That was really great. A uh, couple questions coming in from the chat. Uh, this first one, I'm assuming this one's for you, Leslie. Dave asks, do you feel that the SWOT analysis is still relevant? Dave, thanks. That's a great question. And we feel like it is relevant because it gets you to, to the first phase um, of the second phase, as we pointed out. 
first half of the second phase. But really doing that pest analysis, that deep dive, that's where you really get to the hidden problems or the hidden needs behind the need. So we think that using them together is, is the right way to go. All right, thanks for that. And uh, one more question from Judy. She says, our workforce board needs data more granular than zip code. Uh, can JobsEQ get data more specific? Well, yes, Judy, of course. I, I'm glad you asked that, and I should have brought that out earlier. But, yes, with JobsEQ, we understand that in workforce planning now, whether you're a workforce board or an organization or a company of, uh, or, or an economic developer, higher ed, whatever the case may be, You've you've got to often have data that that that's more clear to you than just the zip code level. So Jobs EQ now in several of those analytics that I show you goes down to the census block level, where the only labor market uh, 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 intelligence software out there that does that right now. We can get to the to this to the census block level uh, in several of those analytics. You can you can draw those. You can you can click on them whatever the case may be, you can even feed a file of those, the census blocks into jobs EQ and it will, it will map that for you and it will take you down and give you the data you need for particular census blocks. So uh, it's something I'm very excited about that, that we've got now because it can really get your planning down to, you know, what neighborhoods uh, are we looking at that, that really need our help, our assistance, uh, where can we pull employees from certain neighborhoods? You know, what is the, you know, the demographics of those neighborhoods? What can we do to, 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 to bring them in to, to our company or to, to help them in our region to, to really help, uh, you know, expand our workforce and make us more competitive? So, so yeah, it, it, I understand it's, it's more than state level. It's more than county. It's more than zip code. Uh, oftentimes you need data more granular and, and Jobs EQ has it. Uh, when you, we can take things down to the census block level now. Well said. Well, that just about wraps things up. Uh, if you check on the website later, you can view the slides for this recording. And thank you for coming and posting those questions. And see you guys next time.